Greetings, I am Vladimir Lenin, and I am eager to unveil my tale to you. I was born on April 22, 1870, or April 10, according to the old-style Julian calendar, in the city of Simbirsk, which is over 700 kilometers east of Moscow. My father was Ilya Nikolaevich Ulyanov, who was born into a serf family in Russia in 1831. However, he gained his freedom in his youth and went on to study physics and mathematics at Kazan University. My father had a successful career as an educator and public school supervisor in Russia. He eventually became a state councillor, which elevated our family to the minor Russian nobility due to his contributions to public education within the Russian Empire. My mother, Maria Alexandrovna Blank, came from a mixed heritage of German, Swedish, Russian and Jewish origins. It seems likely that I was not aware of my mother's Jewish ancestry. My parents had a total of eight children, two of whom died in infancy. I was the third eldest, born after Anna in 1864 and Alexander in 1866. My childhood was comfortable, reflecting my father's increasingly successful career. We lived in a well-appointed home in Simbirsk and also spent holidays at a manor in Kokushkino in the countryside. I emerged as my father's son, displaying considerable intellect during my teenage years. I excelled at school and became an accomplished chess player. However, the idyllic upper-middle-class life of my childhood was soon shattered. At the age of 15, my father died prematurely of a brain hemorrhage in January 1886. This event had a profound impact on me, leading me to become increasingly reactionary and rebellious. The situation was further compounded the following year, when my older brother Alexander, who had left earlier to attend St. Petersburg State University, was implicated in a conspiracy to assassinate the ruler of the Russian Empire, Alexander III. My brother, along with several others, was executed shortly afterward for their role in the conspiracy. This series of events changed me forever, and my subsequent descent into extremist politics in Russia can be traced back to them. My actions and those of my brother Alexander in 1887 must be understood within the political landscape of Russia in the second half of the 19th century. For centuries, Russia had largely remained outside the mainstream of European politics and culture. However, efforts have been made to modernize and reform the country since the reign of Peter I in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. These efforts aim to make Russia more like other European states such as France and the Austrian Empire. Catherine the Great, who succeeded Peter I, continued these reforms in her pursuit of making Russia a modern nation. The expansion of the Russian Empire played a significant role during this time, with Russian explorers and colonists reaching as far as the Bering Straits and Manchuria by the end of the 18th century, extending our state's reach to the Pacific Ocean. In the West, Catherine embarked on a series of conquests that brought parts of the Caucasus, Poland and Ukraine under Russian rule. However, despite these developments, the country remained backward in many aspects. Serfdom, which tied Russian commoners to the land and their lords, still prevailed. The economy remained largely agrarian, and the Orthodox Church held immense influence over society. The country was highly authoritarian, ruled by the Tsars and the nobility for their own interests. In comparison to nations like the United States, Britain and France, which were undergoing modernization in the 19th century, the Russian Empire appeared politically and socially outdated. These challenges were further exacerbated by events leading up to my birth and throughout my formative years. In 1855, Alexander II ascended the throne as the Tsar of Russia. He was a liberal reformer who aimed to modernize Russia. In 1861, he abolished serfdom and emancipated the serfs, marking one of the most significant social reforms of the 19th century. He also sought to reform the courts, policing and education system. However, in 1866, Alexander II narrowly survived an assassination attempt which tempered his liberal inclinations. Nonetheless, the reforms he initiated sparked intellectual discussions in Russia. Writers such as Fyodor Dostoevsky, Pyotr Kropotkin and Mikhail Bakunin questioned Russian society and explored ideas and political theories like anarchism, nihilism and communism. Many Russians, as a result, advocated for further societal reforms, including the establishment of a parliament and an end to the autocratic rule of the Tsars. Groups like the Narodniks and the People's Will emerged as political and terrorist organizations advocating for these changes. In 1881, the People's Will succeeded in assassinating Alexander II, leading to a period of increased discontent. His son, Alexander III, succeeded him and opposed his father's reforms, aiming to suppress liberal dissent in Russia. Thus, the Russia I grew up in during the 1880s was a volatile environment of political discontent and instability. 
It was within this political climate that I arrived at Kazan University in 1887 to pursue my studies. Almost immediately, I became involved in a protest against the government's crackdown on student societies perceived as centres of political dissent. My participation resulted in a brief arrest and subsequent expulsion from the university. However, this short period at the university ignited the flames of political radicalization within me. In the following months, I voraciously read works by various Russian and European political writers, including Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. These German philosophers and social critics were highly critical of the trajectory of industrial society. In their 1848 pamphlet, The Communist Manifesto, they advocated for the replacement of bourgeois capitalist society with a system in which the industrial proletariat collectively owned everything in society. Their ideas resonated with me at a time when industrialization was rapidly advancing in Russian cities such as Moscow, St. Petersburg, Kazan and Samara. However, while Marx and Engels influenced my thinking, my political views were still evolving, although they undoubtedly leaned toward radicalism. Even before turning 20 in 1890, my mother, utilizing her family's connections within the Russian education system, ensured that I could take exams at the University of St. Petersburg. Instead of completing my studies at Kazan University, I passed with first-class honors and subsequently worked as a legal assistant in Samara during the 1890s. Throughout this period, I continued to nurture my political radicalism and actively participated in various political organizations. During this period, Russia experienced a surge in radical politics due to the events of 1891. Following a dry autumn, an extremely cold winter gripped the country, with temperatures dropping below 30 degrees Celsius in some areas along the course of the River Volga. This was followed by a particularly dry spring and summer in 1892, resulting in widespread crop failures across Russia. As a result, famine struck, exacerbated by the inept response from the government of Tsar Alexander III and other influential entities like the Orthodox Church. By the end of 1892, more than 350,000 people had died from starvation, and millions more suffered from malnutrition or other severe impacts. Criticism of the government intensified, leading to a growing support base for radical groups such as the Communists and Nihilists. Feeling increasingly marginalised in provincial Samara, I decided to leave for the capital, St. Petersburg, in 1893. While continuing my work as a legal assistant, my primary focus shifted towards fostering the Marxist and Communist movement in the city. These socially revolutionary groups were effectively outlawed under Alexander III's government. However, his death from kidney failure in 1894 saw his son Nicholas II ascend the throne. Although more liberal than his father, the political climate remained repressive, Upon my arrival in St. Petersburg, I became involved with a revolutionary communist cell comprising primarily of members from the Technological Institute of St. Petersburg. They adopted the name Social Democrats, inspired by the ideology of the German Social Democratic Party, which embraced Marxism and communism. By the spring of 1894, I had already drawn the attention of the secret police in St. Petersburg, as I had emerged as a prominent Marxist figure. Despite the surveillance, my political beliefs grew even more radical in the following months, especially after I met and formed a relationship with Nadezhda Krupskaya, a school teacher who shared radical Marxist views. During this time, I also engaged in underground publishing of Marxist pamphlets in the city. However, these activities led to our arrest in 1895, just as we were preparing to publish a communist newspaper called The Workers' Cause. Following my arrest, I was denied legal representation and detained for over a year before receiving a sentence. My time in jail became a formative period, during which I began working on a book titled The Development of Capitalism in Russia. Eventually, in late 1896, I was sentenced to three years of exile in Siberia, the vast and inhospitable region beyond the Ural Mountain. This punishment, aimed to remove political threats from the civilized parts of Russia, Nadia joined me in Siberia in 1898, and we married shortly after. However, we were unable to have children due to her medical complications. Throughout this time, I continued writing and eventually published The Development of Capitalism in Russia under the pseudonym Vladimir Ilyanov in 1899. In early spring 1900, my exile ended, but the authorities prohibited my return to St. Petersburg. Thus, I briefly settled in Inkovo, a city south of the capital, where I engaged in publishing a new revolutionary newspaper called Iskra, meaning the spark. However, I soon realized that continuing my activities on Russian soil would lead to re-arrest and a more severe sentence.
Consequently, in the summer of 1900, I left for Switzerland, where I connected with revolutionary groups before relocating to Munich in the German Empire. Nadia joined me in 1901. It was during this time that I began writing under the name Lenin, which would become synonymous with my identity. By 1902, Nadia and I had moved again, this time to London, where I remotely managed Iskra, with the paper being smuggled into Russia. In my exile in London, I composed my most famous written work, What is to be Done, in 1902. In this work, I rejected the notion held by many communists that the proletariat would naturally transition society towards a socialist state before establishing a communist one. Supporters of this view believed that communist parties merely needed to facilitate this process. Contrary to that perspective, I believed in a more proactive approach to ensure the triumph of communism over capitalism, even if it meant engaging in overt armed struggle. I posited that the working conditions of the proletariat and other factors indeed fostered a greater desire for a socialist state among workers in countries like Russia, Germany and Britain. However, I argued that they would not naturally progress towards socialism and then communism without the guidance of a revolutionary movement. Once accomplished in one nation, I viewed the Russian communist movement as the vanguard of the proletariat. It would lead the workers of Russia and subsequently Europe toward communism. However, this perspective carried an inherent danger. If the Russian communist movement was responsible for guiding the international communist movement, then any conduct by the Russian communist parties could potentially be justified in the name of the greater good of international communism. During my time in London, I also became involved in a crucial episode in the early history of the Russian communist movement. While I was in exile in Siberia in 1898, the various revolutionary cells and groups that constituted Russian communism united to form the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, RSDLP. The party was established at an underground conference held in the city of Minsk in March 1898. Soon after its formation, the party became a target of the Russian secret police, the Okhrana, resulting in the arrest and imprisonment of several of its leaders. Consequently, it was decided to hold the RSDLP's Second Party Congress abroad, which took place in London in 1903 in a chapel on Tottenham Court Road. However, divisions emerged among the delegates. One faction, led by Julius Martov, believed that party membership should be broad to appeal to as many people as possible, considering that industrial workers in Russia constituted only three of the population. On the other hand, the faction I quickly emerged as the leader of argued for more restricted membership, limited to dedicated revolutionaries. When the vote took place in November, the party split into two. My group became known as the Bolsheviks, while the other faction became known as the Mensheviks. Interestingly, the Bolsheviks, despite being the smaller faction, derived their name from Bolshevik, which ironically means majority in Russian, while the Mensheviks, the larger faction, means minority. This discrepancy stems from the fact that the majority of the editorial board of Iskra supported my faction. Initially, the split between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks did not lead to the creation of two separate political parties. Instead, they remained as two factions operating within the RSDLP. Nevertheless, the division between us became bitter and acrimonious, fueled by my actions. In the summer of 1904, I published a treatise titled One Step Forward, Two Steps Back, which vehemently criticised the Mensheviks. These actions proved successful, and by early 1905, the Bolsheviks were gaining control of the Central Committee of the RSDLP. This development was timely, as significant events were unfolding in Russia in the first months of 1905. On 22 January of that year, a procession of several thousand unarmed workers marched on the Tsar's Winter Palace in St. Petersburg to peacefully present a petition for the improvement of workers' rights in Russian factories. However, the government forces responded with an excessive use of force, opening fire on the protesters. This tragic event, known as Bloody Sunday, resulted in the death of over 150 people and the injury of hundreds more. This incident, coupled with Russia's defeat in the Russo-Japanese War, ignited a revolution across the country in 1905. Workers went on strike in numerous cities, segments of the army mutinied, and agrarian unrest spread throughout the countryside. The revolution of 1905 served as the catalyst for my return to Russia after five years of exile. I soon found myself in St. Petersburg, where I played a pivotal role in establishing a new communist newspaper called Novaya Zizn, meaning New Life. Through this publication and my other writings, I advocated for expanding the membership of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, RSDLP, during this period of intense revolutionary fervour in Russia. However, the party was already losing its momentum. 
In October 1905, Tsar Nicholas II issued the October Manifesto, which granted extensive concessions to the protesters across Russia. The Manifesto included a declaration that granted many civil rights, some of which had been established in Europe since the 18th century, to Russian citizens. Additionally, it promised the creation of a new Russian parliament called the Duma, where political parties could participate in electing members to the Legislative Assembly. This effectively resolved the political crisis and marked the conclusion of the 1905 revolution. Nevertheless, Nicholas later reneged on most of his promises. While a state Duma was indeed established, Nicholas dissolved the first one, which had been elected in 1906 as he deemed its members too radical. The subsequent Dumas proved to be conservative and ineffective governing bodies. In the years that followed, martial law was swiftly imposed in 1906 and 1907, leading to the suppression of political dissent throughout Russia. As the political crackdown intensified, Lenin and the Bolsheviks weighed their options. The 1905 revolution had proven to be a false dawn. The question arose, what was the path forward? One faction, led by Joseph Stalin, a rising figure within the Georgian branch of the communist movement, advocated for engaging in a campaign of terror, attacking state institutions as a means of financing the RSDLP. However, this approach had few supporters, though I was not entirely opposed to it. By early 1906, faced with the escalating crackdown, I crossed the border into the Grand Duchy of Finland, which was a part of the Russian Empire but had a degree of autonomy. Here, the Bolsheviks operated with relative freedom for a time in 1906, easily distributing their printed materials to St. Petersburg and Moscow from just across the Finnish border. However, it became evident that a return to the tactics employed prior to 1905 was necessary. Once again, the leaders of the RSDLP would go into exile primarily in Western countries like Britain, where their activities faced less opposition than in the autocratic East. By 1907, I had returned to London, where the Bolsheviks successfully regained control of the RSDLP from the RSDLP from the Menshevik faction during the party's Fifth Congress, held that summer. Subsequently, a decision was made to relocate the party's headquarters to Paris, where Nadia and I had settled by the end of 1908 as part of our perpetually nomadic revolutionary lives. However, before that, I spent several months conducting research at the British Museum in London during the summer of 1908, which laid the foundation for my book materialism and imperial criticism. The move to Paris also proved temporary, and over the following years, I spent short periods, usually a few months at a time, in Stockholm, Copenhagen, Prague and Krakow. During these years, I experienced a decline in influence within the RSDLP, some factions within the party favoured engaging in parliamentary politics in Russia, despite the fact that the state Duma, established by Tsar Nicholas II in 1905, was merely a facade offering little genuine parliamentary representation. Additionally, both Nadia's and my health were deteriorating. I may have been in the early stages of acute arteriosclerosis, a condition characterised by the build-up of fat and cholesterol on artery walls. Some have also speculated that my health issues were related to neurosyphilis. Regardless of the precise cause of my ailment, it posed significant challenges during my years in exile as my standing within the Russian communist movement declined. In 1912, the split between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks was formalised, leading to the establishment of two distinct political parties. However, an unexpected opportunity for me to reclaim a central role within the Bolshevik party and reignite the Russian communist movement arose with the outbreak of a European war. Tensions among major European powers had been escalating for years, driven by various factors such as Germany's challenge to British supremacy, colonial rivalries in Africa and Asia, and regional conflicts in the Balkans due to the crumbling Ottoman Empire. Russia, in particular, had concerns about the Balkans, where it competed with the Austro-Hungarian Empire to succeed the declining Ottoman Empire as the dominant regional power. Therefore, when a regional crisis erupted in the summer of 1914, it quickly escalated into a war between Russia and Austro-Hungary. Within days, Germany had joined forces with Austro-Hungary and Britain and France declared war on Berlin and Vienna in support of their Russian ally. The First World War had begun, and by its end, Russia would undergo a transformative experience. When the war broke out in late July 1914, I found myself in Galicia, a region spanning modern-day Poland and Ukraine, but then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Initially, I was briefly imprisoned by the Austro-Hungarian authorities due to my Russian citizenship. However, I was able to demonstrate my opposition to the Tsarist regime of Nicholas II resulting in my release. 
Nadia and I then sought refuge in neutral Switzerland, where we spent the next two years while the war raged across Europe. During this time, I continued writing and developing my theories, publishing Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism in 1917. By then, my political ideas had matured, and I was willing to diverge from orthodox Marxism in a manner that few communist ideologists of the 1910s were. Particularly, I challenged Marx's notion that societies must transition gradually from autocracy, ruled by kings and emperors, to a bourgeois democracy governed by the middle and upper classes before a socialist revolution and communism could occur. Meanwhile, in the peaceful Alpine region, Russia's war effort fared poorly. The Russian army faced significant challenges, with poor leadership and inadequate training. On the Eastern Front, it confronted the formidable German Imperial Army, renowned as one of the world's most effective military forces. The situation worsened when Tsar Nicholas II decided to assume direct command of the army himself. In 1916, we witnessed significant Russian gains, particularly through the Brusilov Offensive, which led to the capture of extensive territory in Poland. Romania's entry into the war on the side of Britain, France and Russia also bolstered our war effort. However, within Russia itself, food shortages and social unrest escalated by the end of the year as the war disrupted supply lines and caused scarcity. Dissatisfaction with the Tsarist government reached unprecedented levels, largely due to concerns about the influence of Grigory Rasputin, a mystic and self-proclaimed holy man over the imperial family. The situation culminated in mass protests that began on 23 February 1917 in St. Petersburg, which had been renamed Petrograd in 1914, and soon spread to other Russian cities. Over the following week, the Tsarist government gradually lost control of the country, and by early March, it became evident that the military was no longer willing to intervene decisively to save Nicholas II. With his family surrounded in Petrograd and himself encountering hostile troops on his return from the Eastern Front, the Tsar ultimately heeded the advice of army chiefs and senior members of the Duma, leading to his abdication on 3 March 1917. The brief February Revolution marked the end of the Romanov dynasty. From Switzerland, where I had been living in exile for many years, I quickly became aware of the unfolding events in my homeland. Within days, I began preparations to return to Russia. My influence within the Bolshevik movement had grown during the war due to my stance that the communist movement should abstain from participating in the conflict, condemning it as a clash between capitalist and imperialist regimes. The German government facilitated my return by providing a sealed train, allowing me and several other Russian dissidents to travel from the Swiss, German border, to the North Sea. The Germans believed that my presence would disrupt Russian politics and potentially aid their war effort on the Eastern Front. By March, our group reached the Baltic Sea and crossed by ferry to neutral Sweden, continuing northward through Sweden and into Finland. Along the way, we received updates on developments in Petrograd, where the state Duma had formed a provisional government that appeared to be dominated by a mix of centrist revolutionaries and the liberal aristocracy. However, this new regime encountered immediate challenges as the Russian front lines on the Eastern Front collapsed due to desertions and a lack of leadership. On 16 April 1917, when my train arrived in Petrograd, the new regime was already facing difficulties. I wasted no time in strengthening the Bolshevik cause, addressing large rallies of proletarian workers in the city during late spring and early summer. I also distributed the April Theses, which I had written during my journey back to Russia, calling for a new government based on workers' councils called Soviets. Tensions escalated in the following weeks, leading to the July days, a period marked by violent demonstrations against the government, fueled by Bolshevik agitation. In the aftermath of the July days, the provisional government moved to suppress the Bolsheviks. As a result, I and me of my followers fled across the border to the semi-autonomous Grand Duchy of Finland. Other senior members of the party, including Leon Trotsky, an emerging theorist and organiser, were arrested in Petrograd. In the early autumn of 1917, I and my supporters began plotting a new revolution in Russia to overthrow the provisional government. They were not alone, as elements within the Russian army and navy were also plotting against the provisional government, which was on borrowed time due to its mishandling of the war and failure to stabilise the domestic situation. Throughout the autumn, the political climate remained tense in Russia, with General Leva Kornilov, the commander-in-chief of the Russian military, attempting a military takeover. To counter this threat, the provisional government had no choice but to seek assistance from the communists and their workers' Soviets in Petrograd, a move that strengthened the Bolshevik cause. 
In early October, I managed to slip back across the border into the capital, where Leon Trotsky had been elected as the head of the Petrograd Soviet. The Bolsheviks had effectively outmaneuvered their rivals within the Russian communist movement, the Mensheviks. By this time, the Mensheviks had played a more significant role in the state Duma over the years and had cooperated more with the provisional government since March. On the other hand, the Bolsheviks had maintained an uncompromising stance since the early 1900s. Therefore, when I returned to Petrograd in October, the conditions were ripe for the Bolsheviks to seize power in Russia once and for all. The coup that took place in Petrograd on November 7, 1917, or October 25, according to the Julian calendar used in Russia at the time, became a momentous event in modern world history, celebrated by the communist movement as the October Revolution. The coup followed several weeks of planning by me, Trotsky and others in Petrograd in early and mid-October. Armed militias were prepared in Petrograd, Moscow and other cities to overthrow the government. The strength of our movement is evident in the fact that the provisional government was aware of the planned uprising but couldn't prevent it. Despite their efforts to shut down the city of Petrograd on October 24 to forestall another revolution, Trotsky and I responded by calling on the Military Revolutionary Committee and the Soviets to occupy government buildings on October 25. By the end of the day, most of Petrograd and Moscow were under Bolshevik control. The following day, the Bolshevik Red Guards, our revolutionary soldiers, entered the Winter Palace in Petrograd and Effectograd and effectively removed the provisional government from power. That evening, a Congress of Russia's Workers' Councils, the Soviets, was held in Petrograd. The Congress culminated on October 27 with the declaration of a new socialist government. In order not to alienate the majority of the Russian population, who were mostly agrarian agricultural workers, we initially avoided extensive discussion of a communist state. However, it was effectively established in late October 1917. Within days, we made our views and intentions known to the wider political community across Russia. The Russian Empire was a diverse realm, stretching from the Baltic Sea in Europe to the Pacific Ocean, and from the Arctic Circle south into the deserts of Central Asia. It encompassed various ethnic groups, including Russians, Ukrainians, Poles, Georgians, Finns, Latvians, Estonians, Lithuanians, Moldovans, Kazakhs, Turkmen, Armenians, and the many ethnic peoples residing in the sparsely populated Siberian region beyond the Ural Mountains. It was crucial for us to assure these diverse groups that the new government would govern Russia for the benefit of all its people. Therefore, on November 2, 1917, just days after seizing power in Petrograd, we issued the Declaration of the Rights of the Peoples of Russia. This declaration affirmed the equality and sovereignty of all ethnic groups living under Russian rule, granting them the right to self-determination. It also abolished religious and national privileges in accordance with Marxist ideology. The document, signed by me and Joseph Stalin, who had risen to prominence within the Bolshevik movement since his emergence during the 1905 revolution, stands as a testament to the idealism of the Bolshevik revolution, at its inception, the declaration effectively announced that the imperialism that had characterized the Russian Empire would no longer persist. The subject peoples of the Tsars were given the opportunity to determine their own political future. Within months, my communist regime began to break its promise. The October Revolution did not automatically lead to the establishment of a one-party state. Prior to the revolution, the provisional government had been preparing for elections to form a new constituent assembly, and the Bolsheviks followed through with this plan in early 1918. It is important to note that other factions within the revolutionary movement in Russia, including the Mensheviks and other leftist and revolutionary groups, also had claims to power. Therefore, a Russian Constituent Assembly convened in January 1918. However, events were unfolding rapidly as the Bolsheviks, who formally renamed themselves as the Russian Communist Party in March 1918, appeared to consolidate absolute power. In the ensuing months, real power increasingly rested with the workers' councils or Soviets in cities like Petrograd and Moscow, while centralised power was monopolised by the political bureau of the Russian Communist Party. Simultaneously, the party initiated a campaign to expel Mensheviks and members of other socialist and revolutionary groups from the Soviets and other political bodies. By the end of 1918, the Russian Communist Party effectively transformed Russia into a one-party state under their control. During this transformative year, I emerged as the leader of the new communist state. Most notably, I chaired Sovnarkom, the Council of People's Commissars, which governed the Soviets or Workers' Councils throughout Russia on behalf of the Russian Communist Party. Eventually, Sovnarkom would become one of the main executive branches of the evolving Soviet Union. 
The chairs of Sotnikom would later assume the role of the official head of state, although these titles and responsibilities were still evolving in 1918. In addition to chairing Sotnikom, I also served on the political bureau and the Council of Labour and Defence. When I relocated to the Kremlin in Moscow, the historic centre of government prior to Sir Peter I's relocation of the capital to St. Petersburg in the early 18th century, I did so as the most powerful figure within the new communist regime. However, this came at a cost, as the political environment remained highly unstable. In 1918 alone, there were three serious assassination attempts on my life. The third attempt on the morning of August 30, 1918, resulted in me being shot twice and severely wounded, with blood entering my lungs. My already precarious health rapidly deteriorated thereafter. In parallel with the government's reorganization in 1918 to establish a country governed by the political bureau Sovnikom and the Soviets, the Communist Party began implementing significant economic reforms in line with Marxist ideology. Less than two weeks after the October Revolution, on November 8, 1917, the new government issued a decree on land, declaring that all land previously owned by the Russian nobility and the Orthodox Church was now confiscated by the state and would be redistributed among the peasantry. In line with communist principles, a debate ensued involving me and others regarding the agricultural policies that should be pursued thereafter. I favoured the establishment of large collective farms under state control, but this issue would take time to resolve. In urban areas, major industries and factories were also nationalised, placing them under state ownership and effectively handing control to the Soviets. Furthermore, labour laws underwent reforms. For example, the working day was limited to eight hours, a progressive decision considering that workers across Europe, in countries like Britain and Germany, had been advocating for decades to gradually reduce the working day from as long as 14 or 12 hours. Alongside these economic and property reforms, my government passed a wide range of legislation in late 1917 and 1918, transforming the social and legal landscape of Russia. For instance, as a communist, I rejected religion. Therefore, in January 1918, my government issued a decree to immediately separate church and state. This was a significant move considering that organized Christian churches still held considerable influence over education and social matters in Europe. Simultaneously, the new communist state took action to address the lack of comprehensive education in Russia by providing free education to all citizens, as only a small portion of the population had access to such education. In the early 20th century, this was a momentous development, accompanied by efforts to combat widespread illiteracy. Other aspects of Russian society, including banking, transportation, trade and communication, were also gradually brought under state ownership. Furthermore, the old legal system inherited from the terrorist regime was swiftly replaced by a new system presided over by people's courts. These courts differed from common law courts in Europe, particularly the British system, as they comprised a judge and two people's assessors. The assessors, similar to jurors in common law, possessed greater decision-making powers, working alongside the judge. Of course, in addition to these economic and social reforms, we still had to contend with the ongoing war. The year 1917 had been disastrous for Russia's war efforts on the Eastern Front. Mass desertion and the unwillingness of many Russian military commanders to fight under the Tsarist regime and later the provisional government following the February Revolution led to significant German advances spanning a wide front from the Baltic Sea to Poland and Ukraine. Recognising that Russia could not extricate itself from the conflict without territorial losses, my government swiftly initiated negotiations with Berlin. Our goal was to end Russian involvement in what I had consistently denounced as a capitalist imperialist war. As a result, on March 3, 1918, just four months after the October Revolution, Russia and the Central Powers, led by Germany, signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. According to the treaty's terms, Russia effectively relinquished control over its territories in the Baltic states, Poland and Ukraine. Germany annexed a significant portion of Russian territory in Poland, while the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia became independent German vassal states. Ukraine achieved its independence, as did Finland. Moreover, Russia ceded some territory in the southeast to Germany's ally, the Ottoman Empire. This peace agreement was highly punitive, resulting in the loss of vast agricultural lands, industrial cities and densely populated regions of the Russian Empire. However, by agreeing to the treaty, the emerging communist state freed itself from the war with Germany and focused on consolidating control over Russia. In the spring of 1918, my government desperately sought peace with Germany and the other central powers. 
the October 1917 revolution had faced significant opposition within Russia, leading to the development of a civil war across the country. The primary adversaries of the new regime were known as the White Army, in contrast to our Red Army. However, the Whites encompassed a diverse range of counter-revolutionaries who refused to accept the new order. Among them were segments of the old Russian aristocracy and the Orthodox Church, both of which had suddenly lost their immense wealth and power that they had enjoyed for centuries. The White Army also consisted of dissenting factions within the Russian army and navy who opposed the communist takeover, as well as centrists and leftists who opposed the revolution. Once it became clear that the Bolsheviks would monopolize power and that democratic communism would not be established in Lenin's Russia, the counter-revolutionary forces intensified their opposition. By the spring and summer of 1918, significant parts of Russia had fallen into the hands of an unorthodox alliance of anti-Bolshevik forces. The early stages of the Russian Civil War posed challenges for my government, influenced by events occurring elsewhere. By late autumn 1918, the First World War was drawing to a close as Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire experienced internal collapses. The war officially ended on November 11, 1918, following Germany's surrender and Kaiser Wilhelm II's abdication. The victorious powers, particularly Britain, France, the United States and Japan, were determined to prevent the new communist state in Russia from gaining control of one of Europe's most powerful nations. From late 1918, Britain and other countries began providing substantial resources to the White Army. Expeditionary forces were dispatched to Russia, and with Western assistance, the newly established state of Poland went to war against Russia. During this period, the civil war in 1918 and 1919 proved extremely challenging for my government, and it seemed for a while that the new regime might not survive. The immense crisis faced by the fledgling Soviet state in 1918 and 1919 must be considered when evaluating its early development. Confronted with multiple threats to its existence, my comrades, including Trotsky and Stalin, resorted to state terror to maintain control over the remaining Soviet territory. This began as early as December 1917, when I ordered the establishment of the Emergency Commission for Combating Counter-Revolution and Sabotage, commonly known as the Cheka. This was the first of the powerful secret police services created during the 74-year history of the Soviet state. The Cheka's primary task was to identify and eliminate counter-revolutionaries and enemies of the state. Its leader, Felix de Zizinski, was granted extensive powers for this mission. Within weeks, hundreds and then thousands of perceived enemies of the state were arrested and executed without trial. Many others were detained and sent to labor camps established in remote and inhospitable regions of Siberia. Although I attempted to distance myself from what became known as the Red Terror, I must acknowledge that I was the head of the Soviet state during a time when harsh measures reminiscent of the worst aspects of the Tsarist regime were employed to construct a security state that would shape Soviet Russia for the next seven decades. The Red Terror was just one component of the brutal policies adopted by the emerging Soviet state to fight the civil war and secure its rule. Another measure was the use of blocking units in the war effort. The concept of blocking units originated from Leon Trotsky and involved deploying Red Army units behind the Soviet front lines to shoot any soldiers attempting to retreat. Brutal as these methods were, they proved effective. The war effort reached a critical point in the summer and autumn of 1918 when a British and French expeditionary force landed in Arkhangelsk on the White Sea. Even before the war against Germany had officially ended, a legion of Czech and Slovak soldiers who had penetrated deep into Russia captured the city of Kazan. Additionally, the Japanese launched an attack on Vladivostok, the main port in the east. However, Trotsky successfully mobilized the Red Army to retake Kazan in September 1918, followed by the recapture of Samara in October. However, our efforts faced setbacks when newly independent Poland declared war in November. Yet, the initial onslaught by the Western powers and their proxies in 1918 failed to crush the communist state, and the end of the First World War brought about conflicts in Ireland, Turkey and other regions. In 1919, the Red Army launched an offensive. In early February, we regained control over Ukraine by capturing Kiev, which we had lost with the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. By April, the British, French and American troops in Ukraine were compelled to withdraw from the region as the port of Odessa fell to our forces, solidifying communist control over Ukraine. In August, the British and French expeditionary forces stationed around Arkhangelsk and Murmansk in the north, near the White Sea, were evacuated. From then on, the Western powers mainly engaged the Soviets indirectly through their proxies in the White Army, Poland, and some of Russia's neighboring countries, although there was a small American and Japanese presence in the Far East. 
Meanwhile, the focus of the war shifted to Russia's conflict with Poland in the West. Initially, the Poles made significant advances, including the seizure of Kiev in early 1920. However, after a Soviet counteroffensive threatened Warsaw, an armistice was agreed upon in the autumn. Thus, by the end of 1920, my regime had largely emerged victorious in the Russian Civil War. Although mopping up operations continued in various locations until the recapture of the port of Vladivostok in October 1922, which marked the end of the war. During the Civil War, I entrusted the leadership of the Red Army to others, most notably Trotsky. Instead, I devoted the late 1910s to formulating a new approach to international socialism and communism. This was in response to the British Labour Party's call in 1918 for a new International Conference of Socialist Parties, which later came to be known as the Labour and Socialist International. However, I grew disillusioned with the more moderate socialist movements prevailing in Western Europe during my years in exile and was committed to establishing a new international socialist movement led by Soviet Russia. Consequently, in March 1919, the first Congress of the Communist International, commonly known as the Comintern, took place in Moscow. There was great optimism at the Congress regarding the possibility of a worldwide socialist revolution, especially considering the recent communist uprisings in Germany and Hungary. However, those uprisings were soon suppressed, and in my later years, I became aware that an immediate overthrow of the international capitalist system was unlikely. Nonetheless, the establishment of the Comintern held immense significance, as it would serve as a major instrument of international communism led by the Soviet Union in the years to come. Another important policy of the Soviet regime under my leadership deserves attention. The new economic policy, NEP, introduced in the spring of 1920, one as the civil war was winding down. The NEP represented a shift in my previous staunch adherence to ideological Marxism. It surprised many when I outlined plans for a new economic system that allowed for a limited continuation of the capitalist free market in Russia. It was declared that individuals could own small amounts of land and businesses, although major industries and large agricultural estates remained under state ownership. The purpose of the NAP was to stabilise the Russian economy in the aftermath of the war and introduce some growth into the system, especially as the country faced the worst famine since 1891 and 1892. Ultimately, the NEP proved to be a major boost for the Russian economy as it emerged from the war and highlighted the advantages of allowing limited private ownership and free trade to continue. Yet, the gradual abandonment of the new economic policy in the 1920s accompanied the intensification of state management of industry and farm collectivization. This shift in the early 1920s raises questions about how we should perceive my overall political thought. After all, it represented a departure from classical Marxism. However, I had been willing to depart from the writings of 19th century German political theorists for some time. By the 1920s, Leninism had become its own distinct brand of communist thought, which continued to influence communist regimes worldwide throughout the 20th century. Essentially, the core idea of Leninism was that a socialist revolution did not necessarily require the prior development of a bourgeois democracy and capitalist system which would create a large urban proletariat capable of implementing the socialist revolution and subsequently establishing a communist state. Instead, I advocated for the concept of a dictatorship of the proletariat, even if it existed in a small-scale form within a particular state. This vanguard party of the proletariat would then guide the rest of society towards socialism and communism. This was a significant development. Marx would have dismissed the idea of communism emerging in countries like China, Mongolia or Angola, where industrialization was limited and there was little presence of a large urban proletariat. However, Leninism, with its message of a small vanguard leading any nation towards communism, had a profound impact on the 20th century. Unfortunately, I did not live to witness the full implications of these ideas. My health had been declining steadily throughout the 1910s, although the exact cause of my illness has never been definitively established. It worsened significantly after surviving multiple assassination attempts in 1918, particularly when I was shot twice and seriously wounded that autumn. In the late 1910s and early 1920s, numerous physicians were consulted to address my health issues. They speculated that I might be suffering from blood poisoning resulting from the bullets that remained lodged in my body following the assassination attempt. In April 1922, I underwent surgery to have them removed, but it did not lead to any improvement. Instead, throughout the early 1920s, I was increasingly confined to Moscow due to a combination of symptoms, including insomnia, sensitivity to sound and other stimuli, headaches, nausea, and overall fatigue. 
In the summer of 1922, my health took a severe turn when I experienced the first of several strokes within a few months. These strokes left me partially paralysed and confined to a wheelchair. As my health deteriorated rapidly in the early 1920s, thoughts naturally turned to succession and the arrangements that would be put in place if I were to die or become completely unable to lead the newly named Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, in 1922. While I had never established myself as an absolute dictator, I had become the prominent figure within the Soviet state based on my years of leadership in exile and intellectual influence. It was conceivable that no single successor would emerge, and instead a collective leadership would govern the Soviet Union. However, even I doubted the feasibility of such an arrangement and believed that a preeminent figure should succeed me. In the winter of 1922, amidst my illness, I dictated my last testament. In it, I discussed the qualities of the potential candidates with Joseph Stalin, who had risen to become the General Secretary of the Communist Party by that time, standing out as one of the most prominent contenders. But I had grown wary of the Georgian Joseph Stalin, whom I'd first encountered 17 years earlier during the Revolution of 1905. I believed he was excessively ambitious and lacked intellectual capabilities. Instead, I favoured Leon Trotsky as my successor. The dictation of the Testament was one of my last significant acts. In March 1923, I suffered another stroke that left me unable to speak. My health continued to deteriorate, and I eventually fell into a coma. On January 20, 1, 1924, I passed away. Immediately after my death, political manoeuvring to succeed me commenced. Trotsky, who was recovering from an illness in the Caucasus region, missed the state funeral in Moscow on January 27 due to false information provided by Stalin about the funeral arrangements. Subsequently, my body was embalmed and placed in a mausoleum in Red Square, Moscow, where it remains on public display even after a century. Despite my warnings, many senior members of the Soviet regime and the Politburo favoured Stalin. In the aftermath of my death, Stalin formed a political alliance with two other senior Politburo members, Grigory Zinoviev and Lev Kamenev, which he used to undermine Trotsky. Over the following years, Stalin eventually drove Trotsky into exile and turned against his former allies. By 1929, Stalin had consolidated complete power in his hands and established himself as a dictator in a way that I never had. For the next 25 years, he ruled the Soviet Union in a totalitarian manner, causing the deaths of millions in his pursuit of absolute power. I, Vladimir Ilyich Yulianov, who adopted the pen name Lenin in the early 1900s, was one of the most influential figures of the 20th century. I came from an upper-middle-class bourgeois background, but reacted strongly against it from a young age, partly due to the execution of my brother by the autocratic Tsarist regime in the late 1880s. Over the next 25 years, I emerged as the leading intellectual figure within the Bolshevik movement, developing theories on communism in Russia that went beyond Marx's ideas. The possibility of establishing a democratic legislative assembly in the new communist state was swiftly dismissed, and a dictatorship of the Soviets and the Politburo, with me at its helm, took its place. This drew severe criticism from other communist leaders in Europe and Russia, most notably Rosa Luxemburg, the leader of the German Revolution, and Peter Kropotkin, the intellectual precursor of Bolshevism. It is important to note that I was not Joseph Stalin, but the state that I played a significant role in creating in the late 1910s and early 1920s was highly totalitarian, paving the way for Stalin's ascent.